from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I am Abby Nolan, and I review children's books for the Washington Post, which has been a charter sponsor and enthusiastic supporter of the festival for all of these years. So I'm very honored to introduce Phyllis Reynolds Naylor, who has written 140 books as of now, uh, an e-book, I think, was the latest edition, including such classics as Shiloh, which won the 1992 Newbery Award, and the long-running Alice series, which began in 1985 with 11-year-old Alice McKinley in The Agony of Alice. I can't name all of her books, of course, but I have to mention the series about two feuding families that began with The Boys Start the War, and this wonderful memoir, How I Came to Be a Writer, which talks about how much persistence you have to be, have to be a writer. Ms. Naylor grew up in Indiana, but unlike many of the authors here this weekend, she has lived in this area for many decades. She attended American University and lived in Bethesda, Maryland for many years, and now Gaithersburg. Alice McKinley happens to be a Silver Spring resident. Her latest book is the final installment of the Alice series. It begins with Alice heading off to college and follows her up to the age of 60. It's out next month and it's called Now I'll Tell You Everything, which is really the perfect title to bring Ms. Naylor to the stage. Please help me welcome Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. I'm so glad to be here. Am I, is this too loud, too soft, too, just right? I have an advanced reader copy. This, this is what the galleys, I guess, look like that went out to reviewers, but I can't let you have it, but I brought it because it's one of the few that's floating around. You know, there's something quite mad in promising readers a series of 28 books far in advance when the only thing you can promise is that you'll look both ways crossing the street. I never meant to write a series. I'd only intended to write a single book, The Agony of Alice, about a motherless girl looking for a role model and all the embarrassing things that can happen to her as she's being raised by her dad and older brother. Then letters began to arrive from readers and reviewers said things like, Alice's many fans await her further adventures. And I said, what? <laughs> I finally agreed to write a series provided I wouldn't have to write more than one book a year and that Alice could grow slightly older in each book. I wanted to write other things and I didn't want to be stuck forever in a sitcom. And then at some point, we discovered that very young girls were reading their older sister's copies, so I wrote three prequels to hold them off a bit longer. But what I hadn't realized was that I was writing not just about a girl and her closest friends, but about a family, a neighborhood, a community of people and I needed to remember every darn detail in every single person's life from book to book. The first names of friends' parents, Halloween costumes, each girl's physical description, phobias, talents. I had to be able to recall every Christmas celebration, vacation, the make of a family car, of boyfriend's cars, allergies, anniversaries, doctors, dentists. We soon discovered that I'd given Alice three different birth dates in May, <laughs> that Elizabeth had pierced ears in one book, but not the next, that a minor character was said to be chubby all of her life and described in another book as pencil thin. I couldn't remember if Pamela had sisters and brothers whether Alice lost her mother when she was in preschool or kindergarten. Readers took such delight 
in finding mistakes that we were almost tempted to add a few more. <laughs> but then the publisher asked a brave copy editor to produce an Alice Bible. And finally, I had the most wonderful handbook revised every few years, about 100 pages long, listing every single thing you could ever want to know about any character with page numbers included, a brief synopsis of each book, as well as all of the inconsistencies that weren't caught in time. And this document will soon be available free online at the alicemckinley.com website. It seems to Alice that her whole life can be rewritten in embarrassing things that have happened to her. She remembers how in kindergarten, for example, she used to eat crayons in kindergarten. <coughs> I didn't just eat them either, she says. One day when I was bored, I stuck two crayons up my nostrils then leaned over my desk and wagged my head from side to side like an elephant with tusks. And the teacher said, Alice McKinley, what on earth are you doing? Well, this didn't happen to me, but it happened to somebody I knew when I was in the third grade. And I remember sitting there watching this guy swinging his head back and forth with the pencils dangling from his nostrils. <laughs> And I remember saying to myself, Phyllis, you are now looking at the stupidest thing you will ever see in your life. <laughs> so remember it always, and I did. Much of the time, however, she's really trying to do the right thing. In fourth grade, she and her 16-year-old brother are doing the dishes together. And she asks him if the girl that he talks to every night over the phone is his girlfriend. And Lester spins a wild story about how she's just a girl in need, an orphan whose adoptive parents hate her, the father beats her, and she's trying to save enough money to buy an airline ticket to some faraway place like China, even if she ends up working in a rice paddy for the rest of her life. He's obviously convincing because Alice's sympathetic little heart swallows it completely. She enlists the help of her five best friends and they scour their homes looking for things they might give the orphan. Then they package it up and add $12 and 11 cents. They enclose a little note saying they hope this will help her get away to some place that her dad will never find her, and they sign it, The Secret Six. Alice finds out the girl's address and mails it off. A week later, Lester hears about it and suspects that Alice did it, and he explodes. A box? You sent Lisa money in a box? Alice sniffles with the other stuff. Lester's face looked like it was made out of rubber. The eyebrows kept rising higher and higher. What other stuff? I tried to remember. Well, there was a bar of soap and some socks and a sweatshirt and toothpaste. Now Lester's eyes look like marbles, big marbles. I went on and a paper fan, and beach sandals, and a box of Pop-Tarts, and a bag of rice. A bag of rice? To eat in China with the chopsticks. China, Lester yelped. You said that's where she's going, Lester, to work in a rice paddy to get away from her father. Can't you tell when I'm joking, he bellows. And Alice, in tears, bawls. I'll never believe another thing you tell me, Lester. Never, ever, ever. If you say you're failing high school, I'll just say, yeah, right. If you say your bike got stolen, I'll say, ha, I'll bet. If you tell me you're dying, Lester, I'll just laugh and say, ha, big joke. I won't listen to you ever again. But she does, of course, because Lester and her dad are all she's got. 
Though the Alice books are fiction, a lot of real life goes into it, like those pencils in the nostrils, for starters. And there's the raft scene when fourth grader Alice is trying to get her boyfriend to reenact a scene from a Tarzan movie where he kisses Jane on a raft and rolls off. But every time my boyfriend, Donald Shevers, tried it with me, I got the giggles and rolled off. The questions Alice asks her dad and Lester about sexual intercourse when she's in fifth grade, not knowing whom else to ask, are the same questions that I ask my mother, and Alice's comment, sounds messy to me, was mine exactly to my bemused mother. When Alice is a freshman in high school, falls down the stairs on her first day of school and wets her pants, I'm simply recreating what happened to my own mother back in 1914 on her first day of high school. Situations change slightly, but feelings are the same from generation to generation. <clears throat> I was born in Indiana, and we moved to Illinois when I started the seventh grade. But I came to Maryland in 1958, where my husband and I had an apartment in Silver Spring, and the Dale Music Store in real life became the Melody Inn in the Alice books. Then we bought a house in Bethesda, where we raised our two sons. And after my husband retired, we moved to Gaithersburg. So I've been in the DC area for a long time. What I hear from most, most from fans is the comment, Alice is so real. And I wanted her to be an ordinary girl that almost anyone could identify with. She's not the all-American girl or an ideal teenager. She's simply one girl whom I decided to follow through life from third grade to age 60. And the question that I asked myself continually as I wrote the series was, what would Alice do? I felt almost as if I should be wearing one of those bracelets, WWAD, on it. The mysteries of sex are very much on Alice's mind in middle school. And I can tell you from the emails that I get that this is universal, whether parents think so or not, not just from middle school, but fifth grade on. Alice is never sure what the appropriate behavior should be and what is not. And when at an eighth grade Halloween party, a boy grabs her in the dark and gives her a French kiss. She doesn't know if this is a compliment or an outrage. So she tells Elizabeth, who stares at her in horror. Somebody you don't even know had his tongue in your mouth, Elizabeth cried. Yes, Alice, that's the next thing to being raped, Elizabeth says. Well, not exactly. You were violated, she said. And when Pamela comes along, Liz tells her the news. Somebody she doesn't even know had his tongue in her mouth. The mystery kisser, says Pamela enthusiastically. That's exciting. Alice is obviously getting different reactions and wonders which one to try out on her father. So when she walks in the house later and he asks, have a good time? She answers, I was violated. <laughs> All the expression went out of dad's face and Lester lowered the sports page. I'll admit I enjoyed having something exciting to announce for a change. What happened, Al? Asked dad. I told them about the haunted house and the broom closet and how somebody had given me a French kiss. Dad looked relieved. I'm glad it wasn't anything more than a kiss, he said. That really got to me. Didn't he care? I was still violated, I insisted. Something outrageous had happened to me and nobody was paying attention. 
Well, you don't know who it was, so you might as well forget it, Les said. Be more careful next time. Somebody was responsible for that, I declared. So what do you want Mr. Ormand to do, Al? Apply thumb screws till one of the eighth grade boys confesses, he asked. If it had been you in the closet, I began. I keep out of closet, said Lester. Besides, the poor guy probably did it out of self-defense. If someone cornered me in a closet, wearing black, neck stock, black net stockings and a peacock feather headdress and enough makeup to sink a ship, I probably would have grabbed the first thing I could put my hands on, too. That is so typical, I shrieked. It's always the girl's fault. If she's molested or raped, it's always because she asked for it. Lester tossed his newspaper over his shoulder and threw back his head. Okay, okay, have Mr. Orman line up all the boys in eighth grade and shoot every fifth one till somebody comes clean. Will that satisfy you? I didn't know what I wanted. I wanted to be noticed, but not too much. I wanted to be kissed, but not too hard. I wanted to be like everyone else, but at the same time, I wanted to be different. I wanted excitement and adventure, but I also wanted protection. 13 must be the year of the split personality. That's all I could figure out. <coughs> because the Alice books deal frankly with sexuality, real and imagined, they have appeared on the American Library Association's banned book list more times than I can remember. Probably Alice is based more on me than any, anybody else, but there are many differences. I love to sing. She can't even carry a tune. Um, I just, I really wanted her to be a very ordinary girl, and I've given her many of my feelings. But mostly as I went along, she's a separate girl, and I just, I had a feeling of what she would do next and what she wouldn't do, and I just went with it. And I hope that she's, she comes across as true and real. That's all. What inspired you to write these books? What inspired me to write these books? Um, I think I had found um, a little card belonging to a Catholic school about the agonies of St. Agnes. And I think it was a saint who had refused the advances of a nobleman, and she was tortured by cutting off her breast, I believe it was. It, it, was, it was horrible. Anyway, Alice, who's not Catholic, finds this card, and she's thinking the trials of, of Alice. <laughs> I'm going through trials, too, maybe not like that. but And so I named the book The Agonies, of Alice instead of the agonies of St. Agnes. It, it sounds crazy. I mean, ideas come to you from all, all different kinds of, uh, all different ways. And um, I think I also, I can tell you almost any year of my life that I wasn't doing something incredibly embarrassing. And in the first book, I really concentrate on Alice's embarrassments and People really love to identify with that. And so that was another part of it. And then, of course, it became a series and, you know, the rest. Yeah. yeah. Was there any real-life inspiration for the Boy Stark War series? <laughs> yes. Another publisher had asked me to write a series for them, and I really didn't want to start another series. But I said to them, I will if I can think of some universal thing that would appeal to both boys and girls. And if I can, I'll do it. And if I can't, I won't. And then I was speaking in a gym somewhere, an elementary school, and kids were coming in on both sides. And they were noisy the way kids are. But it upset one of the teachers, and I heard him yell, if you don't quiet down, I'm going to seat you boy, girl, boy, girl. And 
instantly there was quiet all over the gym. <laughs> and I thought, that's it. That's my universal, that, that antagonism at that age, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Because I noticed when kids came in and they sat, two, two classes had to sit together. If it was a boy and a girl on the end, they would lean over as far as they could so they wouldn't touch each other. <laughs> And um, so the first book is The Boys Start the War, the next one is The Girls Get Even, and it goes up to 12 books for the 12, month of the 12 months of the year. That's what started it. <laughs> yeah. Um, what inspired you to write? I mean, why did you start writing? Why did I start writing in the first place? Um, writing little books when I was... Four and uh, in fourth and fifth grade was just my hobby. I loved it. But I think it was because my parents read aloud to us every night for about an hour. First of all, we listened to two or three chapters of the Bible storybook. And after that, after we'd gone through the whole book and then started all over again, we could have um, The Wind in the Willows, um, Alice in Wonderland, um, Oh, what, what is the toad in his motor car? What's that? The, the Wind in the Willows, all those wonderful books. And it was just, to me, that was the best part of my childhood. And if I went on a sleepover, I remember thinking, I'm missing something back home. What am I missing? And I just felt if listening to books was so wonderful, then writing them must be even better. And in some ways it is, and that's why. Did I know someone named Alice? Or did you know someone who was like, like her? A lot of people. I, I think I, I choose little bits and pieces of a lot of people. I knew a lot of people like Elizabeth. Parts of me were like Elizabeth. Um, parts of me were like Pamela. And a number of times on the Alice website, I've just thrown out this question, which of the three girls do you identify most with? And, of course, now we have Gwen, who's also a fourth and um, I'm surprised that most of them identify with Elizabeth, who tends to be the shyer, a bit more prudish, and Alice is a close second, and Pamela is sort of a third. Why did I write the Shiloh books? I, on the back cover, it tells a little bit, but my husband and I were visiting college friends of his in the little community of Shiloh, West Virginia. And Rex and I got up early one morning and we're walking along Middle Island Creek, and I could see the weeds moving off beside me. I knew that some animal was over there following us along, but couldn't tell what, who it was. And so I finally went through the weeds and found the saddest little dog I've ever seen. She was sort of like a beagle. She was f female. She was lying on her stomach, filthy, with ticks on her, so skinny you could see her ribs. And her tail was wagging, but every time I knelt down and just tried to stroke her, she was much too frightened. She just crept off on her belly. So I didn't try anymore. We went on walking and... Um, Finally, we turned around to come back, and then it started, ra it was raining really hard, that's why we came back. And then she was on the path behind us. We would move, the dog would move, we would stop, the dog would move. And I don't know what made me do it, but I turned around and whistled. And she came running, leaping up, licking my cheek like it was an entirely different dog. I, I never understood that. Followed us back to the home of our friends who saw us coming, opened the door for us, and closed the door on this stray dog. And we changed clothes and had breakfast, and I looked out the window, and there she was in the rain watching the, the window. And we had lunch, and I looked out. She's still in the rain watching. And I, I was so upset. And they said, Phyllis, you don't know how often we see this. People drive up here in the mountains, and they let off a cat or dog they don't want anymore, just push it out, and they think it will survive, but most of them don't. And, but I didn't see this every day. So to make me feel better, they put it, the, the dog in Frank's car, drove her back 
across Middle Island Creek, knocked on the trailer homes to see if anybody knew who she belonged to. Nobody did. And then Rex and I had to leave for West Virginia, I mean for home, Bethesda, and we had two big cats waiting for us. But I couldn't get her out of my mind. I cried. And my husband said, are you going to have a nervous breakdown or are you going to do something about it? And to a writer, that means write. And then three weeks later, I got a letter from our friend saying, do you remember the dog that followed you when you were here? She was still hanging around five days later. We made the mistake of feeding her. Then we took all the ticks off of her and gave her a bath. They took her to the vet, and she turned out she was pregnant. They had her spayed. And they said, we've named her Clover, and she's now the happiest dog in West Virginia. And I wrote back and said, I'm writing a book about her. <laughs> and so it, it was a happy day when I won the Newberry for that. And they were as happy as I was. And that's the story of Shiloh. <laughs> we're in overtime. Overtime? Okay, sh uh, shall we have one more question? And then that's it? Or uh, whoever's in line here, yes. How did you plan out your Alice books? Did they just come to you as you wrote? Or was they did. The, the first one just came to me about a girl and her embarrassments. But then as I knew it was going to be a series, I, I wanted her to grow older in each one. Otherwise, I'd just get tired of her. And I figured out, the, fall, the spring semester, the fall semester, and summertime. And so as the books go on, that's I wrote about three books for every year of her life, and that's the way I planned it out. Is that what you asked? Okay. And did you have a question? Did you have any other people you're related to that wrote books like you? Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.